Championship Fighting Explosive Punching and Aggressive Defense by Jack Dempsey Chapter 9 The Power Line The movements in the second part of a straight jolt are just as simple as those in the falling step. Yet, strangely enough, that part of the punch has been the big blind spot in hitting since the days of Jim Fig in the early 1700s. He was the father of modern boxing. By the time John L. Sullivan and later old masters came along, many outstanding punchers had eliminated that blind spot with their knowledge of punching technique. But today, that area of darkness is bigger than at any time since Corbett beat Sullivan. At least nine of every ten fellows who try to box never become good punchers because they never learn how to make their arms and fists serve efficiently as conveyors and exploders. They become powder puff punchers, or at best, only fair hitters. Their punches lack body weight, explosion, and follow-through. Such failure can be prevented by power line punching. What is the power line? The power line runs from either shoulder straight down the length of the arm to the fist, knuckle of the little finger, when the fist is doubled. Remember, the power line ends in the first knuckle of the little finger on either hand. Gaze upon your pinky with new respect. You might call that pinky knuckle the exit of your power line, the muzzle of your cannon. You'll understand the power line if you feel it out. Stand up. Walk toward a wall until you are at arm's length from the wall when facing it. Put your heels together. You should be standing just far enough from the wall so that you can barely touch it with the tip of the middle finger of your right hand. At a point directly opposite your chin. Touch that chin-high point with your middle finger tip. Now, move back three or four inches, but keep the heels together. Double your right fist firmly. In making a fist, close the fingers into the palm of the hand, and then close the thumb down over the outside of the fingers. See figure five. Extend the fist at arm's length toward the spot on the wall, only toward it. The fist should be upright, as if you were holding a stick running from ceiling to floor. The little knuckle is down toward the floor. With your arm stiffly extended, let your body sway slowly forward. Without moving the feet, until your fist, still upright, is pressed so firmly against the chin-high spot on the wall that your fist and stiff arm are supporting the weight of your leaning body. See figure 6. Note that the lower part of your fist, still upright, particularly the little knuckle, provides the natural, solid end of the firm, straight line from shoulder to fist that is supporting your weight. Note particularly that this line runs unswervingly through your wrist to the little knuckle. See figure 7. Now, with your upright fist still supporting your weight at the chin-high spot, try to shift your pressure from the little knuckle to the upper knuckles. Then, turn your fist so that the palm of your hand is down. When you attempt those changes, you should feel immediately that both new pressure positions of your fist lack the solidity of the first position, and you should feel and see that a change in position swerved the power line at the wrist, putting your wrist in a hazardous landing position. Keeping your feet in the same position, go through the same procedure with your left fist. You will find the power line in the same location, straight from shoulder through the little knuckle. But where would the power line be 
if you wish to lower your fist and punch at a man's stomach. You can answer that by testing a spot on the wall just opposite your own solar plexus. The vital body target just below the end of the breastbone. In making the lower test, sway forward from the same standing position with either fist toward the solar plexus spot. But before you sway, turn your fist palm down so that the knuckles will be parallel to the ceiling when you press your fist against the wall. The power line still runs solidly through the little knuckle. Now that you have felt out the power line, you can appreciate that the greatest possible solidity would be achieved if you landed every punch with the little knuckle first. Unfortunately, however, the hand bone behind the little knuckle is the most fragile of the five backbones. It can be broken most easily. You must not attempt to land first with the little knuckle. Instead, you must try to land first with the knuckle next to your pinky. See figure 8. We'll call that the second knuckle. Aiming with the second knuckle usually brings about a three-knuckle landing. Those three landing knuckles are middle, second, and pinky. If you aim with the second knuckle, those three knuckles usually will land together because the average fist slopes slightly from the middle knuckle to the pinky. Such a three-knuckle landing not only prevents the hand bone behind any one knuckle from bearing all the punch shock, but it also permits punching almost exactly along the power line. Rarely will one of those knuckles make a solo landing, but if you aim with the little knuckle, you risk a dangerous solo landing on forehead on blocking elbow. Always aim with the second knuckle the one next to your pinky, and let the other knuckles take care of themselves. They'll take care of themselves all right, for the shape of the fist makes it impossible for them to do otherwise. Clench your right fist and inspect its knuckles. Your thumb knuckle is out of the way, completely separated from your row of four knuckles on the striking edge of your fist. More than that, your thumb knuckle is farthest away from, from your pinky knuckle, farthest away from the end of the power line. Nature took care of that. Never double-cross nature by trying to hit with that thumb knuckle under any circumstance. It breaks easily. Keep it out of the way. The knuckle of your index finger, the one next to the thumb, is fairly prominent, but not as prominent as the knuckle of your middle finger. In some face punches, and in most body blows, that index knuckle will land with the other three. For a four-knuckle landing, that's okay. Let the index knuckle come along for the ride. Under no circumstances, however, try to land first with that index knuckle. If you do, you'll not only break your power line, but you may also break your wrist. Beware likewise of trying to land first with the prominent middle knuckle, the source of most hand injuries. Such aiming will slant your hand off the power line and, at the same time, endanger the middle knuckle and its hand bone. When that middle knuckle makes a solo landing, its prominence prevents the other knuckles from helping to absorb some of the punch shock. That shock or pressure is terrific in any full-fledged punch, particularly when you nail an opponent with a head blow just as he is stepping into you. In that split second, your fist must withstand the shock pressure of an explosive collision between two hurtling body weights. Let me repeat. If your punch is landed correctly, in power line fashion, the three knuckles, pinky, second and middle will share the pressure to distribute it over the three hand bones behind the knuckles. 
that lessens the chance of bruising or crushing any one knuckle, or of fracturing any one hand bone. Most professional and amateur boxers suffer hand injuries during their careers, even though their fists are protected by bandages, tape, and gloves, because they don't make a fist properly. As I pointed out earlier, the hands have no such protection in a fist fight. You must land correctly, not only for power line explosiveness, but for hand protection. We have examined the power line, and second knuckle aiming for long range straight jolts. But what about other types of punches? What about medium range straight punches, and hooks, and uppercuts? Does the power line and the second knuckle aim hold good for them? Yes, indeed. They do hold good. You must hit along the power line in all full-fledged punches, and you must always aim with the second knuckle. The landing position of your fist may change from upright to sideways in varying degrees when shooting different types of punches for the head and it may change in various degrees from sideways to upright in punching for the body. But always you must punch along the power line, and always you must aim with the second knuckle. You'll get a feel of that power line in other punches later. You will discover that bending the elbow in a hook, for example, does not break the line of power, and you will find out why. Chapter 10. Relaying and Exploding You have learned how to set your body weight into motion for a long-range jolt, and you have located the power line and its exit. Now you are ready to learn the relay and explosion. You can do that best by throwing a jolt. First, we must get something to punch something you can hit solidly without injuring your fists. If you can go into a gymnasium, swell. For in a gym, you will find an inflated pear-shaped light leather striking bag, figure 9, and a large heavy cylindrical canvas or leather dummy bag, sometimes known as the heavy bag. See figure 10. The latter is packed with cotton waste, but it is solid enough for you to accustom your fists, wrists, and arms to withstand considerable punching shock. One can practice both body and head blows on the heavy bag. On the fast light bag, which is about the height of an opponent's head, one can sharpen one's speed and timing for head hunting. And one can also practice the important backhand warding off stroke until it becomes automatic. If no gymnasium is available, and if you are unable to buy bags from an athletic goods store, you will have to carry on without a light bag and make your own heavy bag. To make the dummy bag, get two empty gunny sacks. Put one sack inside the other to give your bags double strength. Then fill the inside sack with old rags, excelsior, old furniture filling, or the like. Sawdust mixed with the above makes an excellent filler. Make certain there are no solid objects in the stuffing of your bag. Leave enough space at the top so that you can wrap the necks of both bags securely with a rope. Suspend the bag on the rope from a strong girder in your basement, barn, or woodshed, or even from the limb of a tree. Do not attempt to use the heavy bag in your living quarters. The pounding vibrations will loosen the plaster in walls and ceilings. Whether you practice punching in a gymnasium or at home, you must use striking gloves, not boxing gloves, to protect the skin on your knuckles. See figure 11. If you can't buy the small mitten-like leather striking gloves, make a pair of your own by snipping the fingers off a pair of leather work gloves, midway down each finger. Cutting them off in this fashion will permit you to clench your fist freely, 
even with the protection of striking gloves, you'll probably skin your knuckles during the first three weeks of punching practice. However, the knuckles will become calloused gradually. Now that you have some sort of heavy bag and some sort of striking gloves, you are ready to begin throwing punches. You're ready to step, relay, and explode. Do it as follows. Put on your striking gloves. Take your falling step position before the bag. The toe of your left foot should be pointing straight at the bag, and the tiptoe should be about three feet out from the bag. Practice the falling step three or four times with your, your arms at your sides. Now, again, take your position for the falling step. As you teeter up and down, Raise your relaxed arms into guarding position. See figure 12. As you raise them, also raise your left shoulder slightly and shove the left shoulder forward a trifle so that your chin, snugly beside it, would be protected from a blow coming at any angle from your own left. Keep your elbows in toward your body. Your relaxed hands are half opened with thumbs resting easily upon the index fingers. The upper knuckles of your left thumb should be about 10 inches forward from your lips. The upper knuckles of your right thumb should be about 4 inches forward from your lips. Teeter in that position until you feel balanced and comfortable. Be relaxed everywhere as you teeter. If you feel cramped by holding your elbows in, let them out slightly, but only slightly. Now, when you feel comfortable and relaxed, suddenly do the falling step toward the bag, see figure 13. And as you step, make the following moves. 1. Shoot your loose, half-opened left hand straight along the power line at a chin-high spot on the bag. 2. But, as the relaxed left hand speeds toward the bag, suddenly close the hand with a convulsive grabbing snap. Close it with such a terrific grab that when the second knuckle of the upright fist smashes into the bag, the fist and the arm and the shoulder will be frozen steel hard by the terrific grabbing tension. That convulsive, freezing grab is the explosion. Try that long left jolt three or four times. Make certain each time that one, you are completely relaxed before you step, and two, that your relaxed left hand in normal guarding position is only half closed, and three, that you make no preliminary movement with either your feet or your left hand. Do not draw back or cock the relaxed left hand in a preparatory movement that you hope will give the punch more zing. Don't do that. You'll not only telegraph the blow, but you'll slow up and weaken the punch. Now that you've got the feel of the stepping jolt, let's examine it in slow motion to see exactly what you did. First, the falling step launched your body weight straight at the target at which your left toe was pointing. Secondly, your relaxed left hand shot out to relay that moving body weight along the power line to the target before that moving weight could be relayed to the floor by your descending left foot. Thirdly, the convulsive desperate grab in your explosion accomplished the following. A caused the powerful muscles of your back to give your left shoulder a slight surging whirl toward your own right. B. Psychologically pulled the moving body weight into your arm with a sudden lurch, and C. Gave a lightning boost to the speed of your fist. D. Froze your fist, wrist, arm, and shoulder along the power line at the instant your fist smashed into the target and E, caused terrific follow-through after the explosion. 
when the long straight jolt crashes into a fellow's chin. The fist doesn't bounce off harmlessly as it might in a light medium-range left jab. No, sir. The frozen solidity behind the jolt causes the explosion to shoot forward. As the solid breach of a rifle forces a cartridge explosion to shoot the bullet forward. The bullet in a punch is your fist, with the combined power from your fast moving weight and your convulsing muscles behind it, solidly. Your fist exploded forward by the solid power behind it, has such terrific follow through that it can snap back an opponent's head like that of a shot duck. It can smash his nose, knock out his teeth, break his jaw, stun him, floor him, knock him out. What was your right hand doing while your left hand delivered its first power punch? Your right hand should have been in a position of alertness to protect you from a countering blow or to follow with another punch to your opponent's chin. As your left hand sped toward its target, your right hand, rising slightly from its original guarding position, should have opened, with all fingers, including the thumb pressing tightly against each other, to form a knife blade, and should have turned its palm slightly toward the bag, as if you were about to chop an opponent's left shoulder with the outer edge of your right hand. However, you do no chopping. Instead, your right hand merely remains tensely alert until the left fist lands. Try a few more left jolts. Make certain each time that your right hand becomes an alert knife. See figure 13. Perhaps you wondered why I started you punching with the left hand instead of with the right, inasmuch as we are speaking speedy development of a knockout blow. I started you with the left for several reasons. Contrary though it may seem, the left fist is more important for a right-handed fighter, not a southpaw, than is the right fist. That is true because in normal punching position, the left hand is closer than the right to an opponent's head or body. Since it is closer, the left is harder for any opponent to avoid than the more distant right. If you can land solidly with a straight left or with a left hook, you'll generally knock your opponent off balance or at least set him up for a pot shot with your right. It's not only easier to hit, to hit an opponent with your left, but it's also safer. When you shoot the left, your chin is protected partially by your left shoulder and partially by your guarding right hand because it is easier and safer to use the left. You usually lead with that fist. When two fighters are warily watching each other, waiting for an opponent at any time during an encounter, the first punch thrown by either is a lead. It's so dangerous to lead with the right against an experienced opponent that the right lead is called a sucker punch. However, there are times when the right lead can be used with deadly effectiveness. As Schmeling demonstrated with his first fight with Lewis. In addition, use of the falling step practically guarantees you're developing a solid left jolt. You have no such assurance if you try to develop a good straight left from the medium range shoulder whirl. The method by which most current fighters put their body weight into motion for a straight, for all straight punches, I'll explain later why straight punches that are powered only by the shoulder whirl cannot have effective follow through. Right now, let me merely point out that when a fellow stands in normal punching position with weight forward and with his left shoulder slightly forward to protect his chin, he can get very little shoulder whirl into a left jolt unless he draws back his left shoulder. Such a move would be a cardinal sin. I use the expression left jolt 
instead of left jab, because I don't want you to confuse the type of straight left you will throw with the futile straight left or jab used by most current amateur and professional boxers. Most of them couldn't knock your hat off with their left jabs. With their lefts, they tap, they slap, they flick, they paw, they paint. Their jabs are used more to confuse than to stun. Their jabs are used as shuttering, defensive flags to prevent their poorly, poorly instructed opponents from getting set to punch. A good fighter doesn't have to get set. He's always ready to punch. Some of them use their jabs merely to make openings for their rights. And that's dangerously silly, for the proper brand of fainting would accomplish the same purpose. But with few exceptions, they do not use the left jab as a smashing jolt that can be an explosive weapon by itself, that can knock you down or knock you out. There are two reasons why the jab why the left jolt is a rarity in fighting today. First, nearly all current boxers launch their jabs with the non-step shoulder whirl. Secondly, nearly all have been fed the defensive hokum that it's less dangerous to try to tap an opponent with the left than to try to knock him down with the left. Concerning that defensive hokum, let me say this. Any time... You extend your left fist, either for a tap or for an all-out punch. You're taking a gamble on being nailed with a counterpunch. And the sap who uses light stuff, tapping, flicking, etc., has his left hand extended much more often than the explosive left jolter who doesn't waste punches, doesn't shoot until he has fainted or forced his opponent into an opening. It's true that you can recover your balance more quickly after missing a tap than after missing a hard punch. But it's also true that an, an opponent who is defending only against taps and slaps will be much more alert to counter than will an opponent who is being bombed. My advice to all beginners is this. Use a left jab Use a light left jab only in one instance, in the so-called one-two punch, when your left fist strikes the opponent's forehead to tip his head back so that your immediately followed straight right can nail him on the chin. Speaking of straight rights, I'll let you throw one now. The straight right jolt is thrown from the same position as the straight left. Stand in your normal punching position. Your relaxed right hand is half opened, and the upper knuckle of the thumb is about four inches in front of your lips. Without any preliminary movement of the right hand, shoot it at the chin-high spot on the bag as you do the falling step. Neither pull back nor cock the right before throwing it. As you step in to explode, the second knuckle of your upright fist against the bag, your chin should be partially protected by your left shoulder, left arm, and left hand. Remember that your left hand opens to make a knife blade, with the palm turned slightly toward your opponent, while the right fist is being thrown. The left hand and arm should stiffen for an instant in order to present a rigid barrier before the face in case an opponent attempts to strike with a countering right. The index knuckle of your opened left hand should remain about 10 inches in front of your left eye as you step in. But the instant your right fist lands, your left hand should relax in its normal half-opened condition so that it, it will be ready to punch immediately if necessary. Straight punches for the body, with either hand, are begun and executed in the same manner as head punches. Any change in position before the start would be a tell-tale. When in motion, however, your fist turns so that the palm is down, 
when the second knuckle explodes against the bag. Also, as you begin the body punch, you bend forward to slide under guarding arms and to make your own chin a less open target. As you practice those punches, keep your eyes wide open. Don't close your eyes as you step in. Focus your eyes on your target. You must keep your eyes wide open at all times when you are fighting or boxing. Keep your eyes open, but keep your ears closed to <laughs> the kibitzers and wise guys who may scoff at your early awkwardness in using the trigger step. They may tell you that you're charging like a warhorse. They may tell you that you're merely poking as you would with a stick. They may tell you that every straight punch to the head should land with the fist in a palm-down position. They may tell you that you are completely off balance, and that you must have a slow recovery if you miss with a stepping punch. You are not charging. You are being shot forward. You are not poking. You are exploding. A stepping straight punch to the head should land with the fist in an upright position to keep the punch straight. The instant you turn your fist to land palm down in a head punch, you will begin to loop the punch. You will learn all about looping later when you study straight punches that are delivered from the shoulder whirl without the step. Don't concern yourself now with balance and recovery. You are punching from the proper stance. As your feet legs and arms accustom themselves to the falling power line explosions they will take care of your balance and recovery they'll make certain that you are still in normal punching stance whether you land on your target or whether you miss don't let anyone induce you to shorten your step before you have mastered this type of punching you must become an expert in using the comparatively long step for two reasons. One, in no other way can you become an explosive long-range sharpshooter, particularly with your left hand. And two, in no other way can you so accustom your body to the lightning forward lurch that the movement becomes instinctive. Later, when the trigger step has become a habit, your body will bolt forward, whether you step two feet or two inches. To make your early practice sessions with the basic long-range blows more interesting, I'll tell you now about stance, and then teach you the fundamentals of footwork.